day for this week's lecture of volume two of our 12-week neuropsychology didactic series um, that brings you lectures from experts in the field covering different topics each week. This series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists to provide free high quality didactic opportunities. And we would like to thank our sponsors for their financial support of the series. Before we start, here are the disclaimers for the series. This training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology, and the views of the speakers are their own. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A box on the lower left of your screen, and we will be recording today's lecture to put on our website later this week. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Dr. Daniel McGrawby for today's lecture on anosognosia. Dr. McGrawby completed a BSc and an MSc in psychology at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and a PhD in psychology and neuroscience at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience in King's College, uh, London. He is currently associate professor at the Pontifical uh, Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro and also works as a visiting researcher at King's College in London. His main area of interest is self-awareness in clinical groups using a variety of methods to explore this topic in neurologic and psychiatric patients. From 2016 to 2019, he was a Newton Advanced Fellow in the Royal uh, Society and Academy of Medical Sciences in the UK. And in 2019, he was presented with the International Neuropsychological Society Early Career Award for his contribution to research in the area of brain behavior relationships. So we are certainly very excited to welcome Dr. McGrawby here today. So we will pass it over to him. Thank you very much, Julia, for the uh, kind introduction. Can you hear me well, guys? Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, I must warn you that I'm doing this from home. So all sorts of things may happen, including uh, my phone ringing and then my dog going on and on. So excuse me if any of that happens, okay? Uh, as I said, it's a huge pleasure to be here. Uh, and it's great to be talking about my main area of research, which is nosognosia. So I included a slightly uh, longer title, I included Nosognosia and Self-Awareness as well, the Neurological and Psychiatric Conditions, but I'm going to be explaining the terminology and when you should use uh, specific terms to describe this condition. Great. Um, so as I said, to begin with, uh, how can we refer to this term? It's even uh, a bit funny because I was talking to Katie, um, I think the first announcement was a nasognosia, which is uh, something that sometimes people uh, spell that way. That is probably not the most correct spelling. So the most correct spelling is nosognosia, which comes from, uh, from Greek, of course. Uh, uh, but it's an interesting thing is that the term nosognosia, which was coined by Babinski in 1914, is probably a bad Greek. Probably he wasn't Greek great uh, Greek, uh, because it should be, uh, maybe it should be nozo of agnosia, because it's a form of agnosia, it's lack of knowledge. So it's an agnosia. Uh, he ended up spelling it a nose of nausea. So uh, a no nozo illness, nausea, knowledge. So, uh, and it's, it's, it's the way that people refer to uh, mainly when they're uh, talking about the neurological conditions. So the neurological liter literature, you see a lot of those uh, You also see the term loss of insight when referring to the lack of awareness in psychiatric patients. So when you're talking about psychosis, when you're talking about bipolar, typically you uh, refer to loss of insight. And sometimes you see the term denial as well. The problem with the term denial is that it, it implies psychological defense. And we're going to see that that's not the case. Often what you have is a newer cognitive impairment and not a defense mechanism. I've, I've been preferring to use, uh, I, I use all of these terms depending on the context, but I've been preferring to use uh, self-awareness and impaired self-awareness lately. I think it's a more neutral term, it's uh, descriptive. Uh, 
uh, and I think it encompasses uh, a variety of phenomena. Uh, as I said, there's a most of the first lack of uh, awareness of having an illness. And maybe uh, in acute cases, we're talking about something else. We're talking about self ability, we're talking about personality, not a condition per se. So uh, I've been using a lot of uh, self awareness as well. And I like the notion of exploring and investigating self awareness because it's a, a true quest. Of, of humankind. Um, and it's something that I've been uh, uh, struggling with for centuries. That's why I referred to as, as a quest. Uh, it, it was uh, written at the uh, walls of the article of Penelope, Know Thyself, uh, the notion of being that you would go there to know your future. So, in order to know your, know your future, you actually have to know yourself. So there's something very interesting about that, like knowing who you are to be able to predict to you the next steps. Um, it's also something, uh, it's not only it's in, in, in Greece, uh, which is the cradle of Western civilization, but uh, also in the Eastern cultures. So uh, I had academia that provides you with very interesting opportunities, and I had the chance to go to Japan to give a talk a few years ago. And I went to uh, Fushimi uh, Inari, which is a collection of shrines in Kyoto, very beautiful place. And as it's going, it's, and it's huge. So it takes you like uh, almost three hours to get to the uh, top of it. And you go climb the mountain. Uh, and we're getting very close to the top. Uh, there is a shrine for the god of insight slash eyesight. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's very touching because people with uh, eye conditions, uh, they go there to get the blessings of this God from the Kofami, and it takes something like two and a half hours to get there. Uh, and a, a very interesting feature is that uh, the shrine is guarded by a fox. And uh, we know that self-awareness, the way we think about self-awareness scientifically, it's something that we see in mammals, but we have less consistent evidence. We do have evidence, we have less consistent evidence for other animals. So it's, it's interesting, and also, of course, the symbolic association with the fox or shrewdness. So, um, Robbie, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, we're just getting a few messages in the chat that um, some people are having a hard time hearing you. So I'm not sure if um, maybe you can scoot closer to the mic. Um, or maybe okay, I'll try that. I'll, I'll try uh, speaking louder as well, guys. Ah, uh, that's the same. Is, is this better? Yeah. So we're telling, I'm telling, I'm telling on the history of self-awareness. It's really a shame you guys didn't hear me, but essentially saying how uh, the terminology, of course, uh, how uh, I like using uh, impaired self-awareness, which is uh, a more neutral term. But you have a nosognosia in the neurological literature, loss of insight for psych uh, psychiatric patients in denial as a psychological defense mechanism. And then I was saying how important that is as a theme. It's uh, uh, back to the cradle of Western civilization in Greece and also in, in Eastern cultures. So it's a, it's a true quest for uh, humankind, but also a huge challenge. So it's very hard to have uh, self awareness. And uh, you may have had the experience of, uh, for example, seeing yourself uh, through a, a funny angle, for example, in a picture or in a mirror. And uh, it's, it's always very unsettling. And this was uh, captured in, in poetry, in art. Uh, so there's this Burns, the Scottish national poet. And he has a poem, uh, uh, it's called uh, To Allows. And it describes a woman uh, who walks into a church and everyone is uh, staring at her. Uh, she thinks they're looking at her, uh, uh, her new hat, but actually they're looking because her head is full of lice and, and burns. Uh, he uh, writes, with some power, give us the gift to see ourselves as others see us. And that's a, there was a very interesting thing in relation to that, which is we now know that one of the ways of fostering self-awareness is showing information in a third-person perspective. So if you see yourself in mirrors, and this has been done in the case of patients with different conditions, you can use mirrors, you can use filming, that may be a way of fostering self-awareness. So something very interesting there. 
And uh, as I said, it's a challenge and, and, and my uh, uh, last example out of my neuropsychology and neuroscience is something that maybe for you in the US is not very relevant, but huge in Brazil, which is soccer. Uh, and uh, this was written uh, the day uh, before Brazil and Germany played in the 2014 World Cup. And the journalist writes why Brazil uh, is favorite against Germany. And he mentions that we have the best defensive system in the world. Again, I'm not going to assume you, you follow soccer, but it was 7 months in Germany, which is total trash in soccer terms. Um, before the game was over, uh, he was already writing about like, the uh, biggest humiliation in the history of the national team. Uh, he never acknowledges here that he uh, thought we, we were favorites. This doesn't really appear here at all. And, uh, and I developed this morbid curiosity about this guy's career. And, and now he works with science journalism, which is a field in which uh, lack of self-awareness is rampant. Uh, of course, I'm not doing this, uh, uh, nothing against this particular guy, just to show how difficult it is to know about our difficulties. It's very hard to have clear self-awareness. You have so many blind spots. So that's why I think this is such a relevant and fascinating thing. I hope you guys are hearing me better now. Okay, now thinking about neuropsychology, why is this relevant to neuropsychology? I think clinically, and I suspect many of the people who are attending this lecture, they are clinicians and they claim to be clinicians. Uh, uh, anosognosia or lack of self-awareness is very relevant for treatment compliance. Think well, if you don't think you have a condition, if you don't agree with your clinician that you have problems and difficulties, why would you treat yourself? Why would you seek any form of treatment? And we actually were able to show that in the paper indicating that uh, neuropsych rehab was only effective in people with awareness. So uh, those who were unaware of their condition didn't benefit as much as aware patients of neuropsych rehab. Uh, it's also very, very important for patient safety. It's, if it's not clear to you uh, uh, your difficulties, what you're capable of doing, you may expose yourself to dangerous situations. You may, for example, insist on driving and are able to do it there anymore. So uh, clearly a uh, uh, very strong impact on patient safety. We also know from a variety of studies, and that happens with different clinical conditions, that uh, it is important for caregiver burden. Uh, uh, caregivers, uh, both formal and family caregivers, who try to take care of uh, people with a variety of conditions, those uh, people, they're not aware of their condition, that makes the life of the caregiver much harder. Presumably because the patient uh, does not cooperate, does not collaborate with uh, uh, the attempts of care. So this is very relevant also for, for the family and for formal caregivers. But we also know that uh, it's linked to increases in care costs. So, so the implications, they range from uh, very strict clinical implications to wider uh, social implications. It's a very relevant theme and something that we have uh, to pay a lot of attention uh, from a clinical perspective. How to tackle this phenomenon, how to approach this, uh, how can we assess this, how can we think about that? And uh, I think one of the ways of, of exploring any research topic is actually to try to model that and uh, try to come up with a theory with predictions and then empirically test those predictions. And that's precisely what I've been doing since my PhD. I had the pleasure to collaborate with my uh, former PhD supervisor, Professor Robin Morris, uh, who was the author of the Cognitive Awareness Model, the first two versions. So I was a co-author of the uh, uh, last version of the model. And, um, I'm not going to explain the full model, but uh, uh, essentially the idea here is that anosognosia is heterogeneous. So you may have a similar clinical presentation, which is the patient uh, being unaware, but this may happen for a variety of reasons. Okay? 
And generally speaking, uh, we uh, uh, like to consider three main reasons. Anosognosia being linked to memory. We call this mnemonic anosognosia. So it's the notion that if you cannot consolidate information about yourself, then you end up forgetting your difficulties. You forget what you forget. Anosognosia can be excessive in nature as well. So here what you have is it's a problem in error monitoring and executive functions in general. So you may have difficulties in detecting errors. Or anosognosia can be primary. And actually what happens is that you have uh, the problem is with the emergence of awareness. And this may be due to uh, top-down factors or bottom-up uh, factors. And I'm going to be explaining each of those different types of anosognosia. Um, and I'll begin by talking about mnemonic anosognosia. And, and I've done a lot of work on that, uh, uh, especially the work I've done with uh, people with dementia. Okay? We came up with a metaphor, so, so this was written um, when I was doing my PhD. Uh, we call this as a metaphor, uh, uh, the petrified self. What is, what is in this metaphor? Uh, the metaphor alludes to the fact that uh, people with dementia, they have a core sense of identity, which they retain even in later uh, stages of the condition, but also the notion that they are not able to update their sense of self. So these are the two elements in the metaphor. The core sense of self, which is solid, but also that does not change through time. We call this the petrified self. Uh, we published very recently a paper at the beginning of this year, reviewing the evidence in the past uh, 10 years uh, uh, for this uh, concept. And it's, uh, it's very rewarding to see that the uh, 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 empirical evidence generated in the past 10 years validated uh, the model. Uh, as I said, there are two, two elements in the metaphor. Uh, the first one is lack of update of personal ability. So the notion that uh, patients with memory impairment may be in, in, in referring to people with dementia, but you, you may apply that to any patient with amnesia, with anterograde amnesia. Uh, the notion here being that uh, if you cannot update your personal ability, you are unaware of your difficulties. Uh, so this is evidence from uh, uh, the group of Annalena Veneri. Uh, so what she did here is very basic procedure. She was asking estimations uh, before uh, a, a test, a memory test, and it was a list of words. And uh, here you have the estimation before the test. I hope you can see my pointer. So here you have the estimation before the test. Um, here in red is the actual performance. So you can see that before doing the test, People with Alzheimer's disease, they overestimate their ability. So they suggest they're going to uh, uh, do much better than they actually do. An interesting thing, though, is that after doing the test, uh, they revise their estimations. They become more realistic about how well they can do this test. But then you give a delay and you ask them again after half an hour. And then what happens is that they reset their estimations back, back to pre test levels. What's happening here is that they're exposed to feedback, they respond to the feedback, but then the information is not consolidated. This has been shown in more recent studies as well. So this one is for, from uh, three years ago. So uh, uh, a group by uh, Chris Newman. Um, so essentially what they did here is uh, different types of uh, memory aid and a number of trials. And what you can see here is that regardless of the type of memory aid, what happens is that they uh, become more accurate. They are lower scores in uh, more accurate uh, scores in terms of uh, knowing uh, your ability. So they begin by overestimating grossly their ability. Then in the other trials, they uh, get more realistic. And then you have a second visit. If I remember correctly, it was a week after the first visit. And again, what happens is that the uh, estimation can go up. Uh, for the first trial and to revise again. What's happening is that they're not able to consolidate this information. 
Um, so that's one uh, aspect, is the aspect of not changing, not updating personal ability. Uh, the other aspect is that core uh, um, sense of, of self that people with uh, Alzheimer's disease have. So when you take a look at the general distribution of uh, memories uh, throughout our lifespan, what we realize is that there is a very consistent curve. We remember very little from uh, our first years. We remember uh, uh, a considerable amount of material for the last few years, which is a recency effect that is seen so many different types of memory testing. And uh, we also remember a lot of material from uh, early adulthood, what is called a reminiscence bump. What happens with uh, people with AD is that they don't have the recency period because of damage to the hippocampus. So they're going to rely heavily in their sense of self in this reminiscence bump. Um, so this is studied by Sir John Starkstein and collaborators. And what we can see here is that uh, uh, recent memory or memory for recent events is impaired in people with Alzheimer's disease, but then they have uh, these uh, older memories which are uh, more solid. And these older memories, they're available because by then they have achieved hippocampal independence. So they're more semanticized memories, older memories. Uh, so this is the baseline and follow-up. If I remember, this 18 months later, we have a very similar curve. Uh, generally, uh, the uh, 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 patients are remembering less information. So there's a, an overall drop in information. But the pattern is very similar, a pattern in which they remember a lot older information. And they rely on this older information, which is not updated, to define their sense of self, hence the next um, we did, uh, uh, just completed a study about that. Uh, and a Fisher, who uh, did a PhD with me, and I was in, was doing a postdoc in uh, Nottingham, uh, Germany. Um, and uh, we explored mnemonic nosognosia and response to feedback. And we did that using uh, EEG. So we did that using the FRN, which is the feedback related negativity. It's an ERP that uh, uh, responds or is linked to the response to feedback. So essentially what we're trying to explore here is how would people with Alzheimer's disease in relation to older adults and young adults, how would they respond to feedback? And also uh, how well they would estimate their performance over 10, 100 and 500 trials. Our hypothesis was that over uh, 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 a larger number of trials, they wouldn't remember very well their performance. And uh, we ended up finding uh, um, uh, that exactly, that the FRN was uh, uh, comparable in patients in the controls. As you can see, it's slightly attenuated in, in, uh, in patients. It's not as strong as in, in controls, but it's, um, is consistent with a stronger FRN for negative in relation to positive feedback. That's what you find in the control groups and in the literature in general. So they're responding to the task or to the uh, 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 failure trials in this case, it's a single task, uh, in a manner which is consistent to, uh, with controls. Um, so in a trial by trial basis, they're processing the information, how well they did it. But then when you ask over 10, 100, and 500 trials, what uh, you end up finding is that they're accurate when replying over 10 trials, and then the accuracy decreases over 100 trials, and decreases even further with 500 trials. So essentially what's happening there is that they're losing access to the information. So you can do on a trial by trial basis, as shown by the FRN, we can do over 10 trials, but not over 100 or 500 trials. So that's mnemonic phenosognosia. Uh, the other form of phenosognosia that I refer to is primary phenosognosia. And uh, here, uh, uh, the notion is that uh, would it be possible to have damage to uh, a primary site or process? Uh, uh, that would lead to nosognosia despite fairly well-preserved cognitive abilities. It needs to be said there is no awareness center in our brains that 
does not exist at all. So it's more of a process that we are really thinking about. And uh, two notions here, maybe there is top-down modulation. Maybe there are uh, factors psychosocial. Uh, the other explanation is maybe that links to primary anosognosia is the notion of bottom-up integration. So anosognosia in Alzheimer's disease may be uh, linked to disconnection between uh, brain areas. So there is a study by Peretin and collaborators indicating how essentially what happens is the disconnection between memory regions and the frontal lobes that leads or is linked and correlated to anosognosia. Uh, for that reason, we conducted a DTI study. I was planning to submit before the talk. Didn't manage to do that, so hopefully after the talk. So we did a DTI study to explore um, uh, why it matter in uh, people with Alzheimer's disease in relation to an awareness. And generally speaking, what we found was that uh, uh, impaired awareness of disease was linked to uh, uh, damage to white natural tracts in a very widespread manner. So that's very interesting to think as well. Thinking about awareness is something that is not linked to a single region, but that involves the whole brain and connectivity between uh, different brain areas in a very widespread manner. Great. Another feature, and, and here, guys, I'm talking about different features and linking to work that I've done. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about if I'm not covering anything in particular that you'd like to discuss, I'm happy to cover that in the Q&A. But um, this was this is very uh, 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 dear thing to me. This is very relevant. This was something that I worked on during my PhD, which is the notion of implicit awareness. And implicit awareness is an oxymoron because if it's implicit, if it's awareness, it's not implicit, right? Uh, so it's interesting to refer to that as implicit awareness. But what, what is implicit awareness in this context? We're talking about um, patients who do not show explicit awareness, so they do not acknowledge that they have difficulties with depression, but nevertheless, they will show behavioral and affective alterations that are consistent with awareness. So, and, and there are a number of clinical observations about that. Uh, you have, for example, patients that joke about their impairments make symbolic references to their impairments. Uh, patients who uh, say they're fine, but they still follow the treatment. They take their medication, they do rehab. Patients who are going to show um, negative and emotional reactions in relation to neuropsych testing, in relation to discussing disability in general, although they don't acknowledge that openly. Or patients who are going to show behavioral alterations. So, for instance, in the case of people with dementia, um, you have uh, uh, patients who are going to say, if you ask them, can you drive? They're going to say, oh, yes, I can, but have you been driving? No, I haven't. So, they will not acknowledge difficulties in driving, but nevertheless, they're going to use more co pilots. They're going to restrict driving to familiar settings suggesting that at some level they're processing information about the parents. So that's what we refer to as implicit awareness. And we, uh, we wrote this discussion paper because we knew the theme was fairly controversial. So we wrote a discussion paper that was the target of commentary. We uh, did a rejoinder to that. And uh, as I said, that was the main theme of my uh, PhD. So we're exploring. using uh, cognitive tasks. Yeah. And they are referred to as success or failure conditions here. We had uh, an Alzheimer's disease group and a control group. Now, so I'm telling uh, what happened in terms of like the emotional reactivity to these tasks. As you can see here, both in terms of self-reported emotion uh, and in terms of repertoire and intensity of facial expressions, there is no difference between groups. 
So the AD group uh, responds in a manner very similar to the control group. You get more frustrated during the failure condition than during the success condition. They do more facial expressions during failure than during success. So the emotional reactivity is preserved. do is what happens is that uh, for failure they're going to say that they did really well so they do not acknowledge failure but they also show difficulties uh, uh, in relation to success and that's very interesting because as I mentioned before it suggests there is no positive bias here it's not doing this out of psychological defense it's a neurocognitive central mechanism that is affecting them in their estimations of ability because why would they say that they didn't do as well uh, in the success condition? So clearly there's something you were cognitive here, not only a psychological defense. The interesting thing is that um, the impaired awareness uh, 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 does not correlate for, uh, uh, with the emotional reactivity. So uh, there were patients very impaired in their estimation of ability that nevertheless show uh, strong emotion reaction. So no correlations between emotional reactivity and awareness of ability. I have um, a, um, and that links also with the issue of modeling intense mood or thinking about the relationship between mood and awareness. And this is something that I have done, especially in the context of psychiatric patients. Uh, we know that depression is associated with more preserved self-awareness. So, uh, uh, patients were more depressed, they're more self aware, or patients were more self aware, more depressed. And that's consistent across clinical conditions. It happens in many clinical conditions. In a few conditions, it does not happen. It depends on the actual construct. If we're talking about uh, uh, depressive symptoms, if we're talking about depression as a diagnostic label, uh, but it's, it's fairly consistent. And uh, apathy, by contrast, is linked to reduced awareness. So apathetic patients, we tend to have very uh, little awareness of their condition. And then what we do, we get the model that we publish, and we zoom in, and then we discuss a few potential alternatives. So maybe what happens in the case of depression is a depressive realism. People losing their positive biases and becoming more realistic because of depression, or maybe it's just a negative bias. People with depression, they tend to complain. So they're, they're going to be very uh, critical of their ability, right? So maybe it's just a negative bias. Maybe this is not linked to expression, but maybe it's linked to retrieval, remembering information, so with congruent recollection. Maybe that's a potential issue there. In the case of apathy, the main notion for us is that maybe this is linked to affective blunting. So if you're apathetic, what will happen? I'm here, I'm talking to you guys, and if I drop my mug, the breaks, uh, uh, what will happen? I'll get very frustrated. I'll register the information that I did something wrong. However, if I'm apathetic, then the errors will get normalized because they are deprived of their effective signature. So maybe that's a potential explanation. Um, one way of exploring the relationship between mood and, and awareness is uh, uh, looking into bipolar disorder. Because in bipolar disorder, you have a natural experiment in the relationship between mood and awareness. So this is work that was done by Rafael de Silva, who was a postdoc in the lab. So, for instance, we uh, published a study in which we followed for uh, two years, 48 uh, patients with bipolar disorder. They were evaluated in the four uh, different mood states that you, you uh, may have in, in, in the AD. So it was refinement, which is normal mood, depression, mania, and also the mixed state. And we used uh, inside items of uh, classic psychiatric questionnaires. What we found was that, and that's very consistent, you know, fine uh, insight is preserved, 
as it is in depression. So uh, uh, in depressive phase, uh, 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 people with BD, they have good insight about their condition. But that's not the case in mania. When you're in, in mania, they have very shallow insight and don't know really well about their condition and their symptoms. And that also happens in the mixed state. We thought that mixed state, the mixed state would be in between depression. It was not the case. That suggests that if you have a bit of um, a mania, even if the symptoms, they're uh, mixed with depressive symptoms, your insight goes down. Um, another question, we published a series of studies on bipolar, if you're interested in, in the topic, you can uh, look it up. But this is one that I find very interesting, which uh, explores the issue whether there are any long-lasting uh, changes linked to any disorder. So here what we did essentially explore uh, the influence of current mood state, but also previous affective episodes. And what is termed in the uh, bipolar literature predominant polarity, that is, have more than two thirds of a certain type of episode. So here we had over 100 people with uh, BD, and uh, they were divided into people with uh, an enzyme with undefined polarity, people in enzyme with mania polarity, people in mania with undefined polarity, and people in mania with mania polarity. We ended up finding that it doesn't really matter the number of previous episodes or your polarity. In fact, you have like a mania, mania polarity, rather your current mood state. So it suggests that uh, uh, the changes in, in awareness lead to uh, a new disorder they're transient. We decided then to do an experiment on that as well. And that's where it was done by LMD Bertran, who did a PhD with me and uh, a postdoc, and now uh, just moved to uh, take a lectureship at the University of Paris. And uh, so essentially, we explored is this linked to uh, maybe recollection of information? So if we uh, give, if we put people in a certain mood state, maybe people will be able to remember the difficulties back then. So we did that uh, in uh, people with AD. Uh, essentially, they had no differences between mood states before the tasks. And they did the tasks that I, I reported before, reaction time, memory tasks, and the success for a failure condition. As you can see, they get a bit, more, a bit happier for uh, success and a bit frustrated for failure tasks. Uh, but there was no change in awareness in response to reaction time task. So we thought that maybe they would improve the awareness, it didn't happen. However, when you take a look at memory tasks, again, you have this effect of having becoming a bit more frustrated after failure, and there was a significant increase in awareness. So it shows uh, it's not only a case of mood congruent recollection, but also of context dependent memory, because it was not only the case of failing in a task that would remind people of their difficulties, but failing in a task that was similar to their actual uh, condition. Uh, so that showed the potential uh, pathway for clinical interviews and when you're going to ask people about their difficulties. And uh, very interesting to uh, uh, see that uh, the change in the use of nausea uh, uh, showed a negative correlation with apathy. So those uh, uh, patients were apathetic because they didn't react to the task emotionally. They didn't increase their awareness of that. So as I said before, it links awareness with emotional reactivity. Okay, so just to, uh, to finish now, uh, I'll just mention very briefly current experimental work. Um, so, as I said, the whole purpose of having the model is to um, generate predictions, test these predictions empirically, and revise the model with a view of uh, helping clinicians and their work. So, we begin with, uh, with uh, clinical observation, and then we move to theoretical modeling, and then we move to empirical testing, and that uh, feeds back into both clinical uh, practice and the theoretical model. So what we're doing right now, uh, we're 
glitching in data collection, uh, on autobiographical memory, uh, uh, mass acquisition and insight. We use this in Albania. Uh, also, explore metacognition in people with PT. Um, we're also doing, as I said, work uh, linking error monitoring. Uh, I showed before the FRN, the feedback related negativity. So, we have some more work with EEG, which is the error related negativity, the RN. ERN and the LPP, which is an European Denmark's uh, emotional reactivity. So we're trying to see if this notion of apathy and effective blunting, driving anosognosia, if this is consistent using EEG methodology and seeing if the response to errors is somehow linked to emotional reactivity in general at a brain level. Uh, we're also opening uh, new uh, lines of research, in particular uh, working uh, with uh, neuro-oncological patients. So I was mentioning work with people with dementia, but uh, as you know, dementia is linked to global brain atrophy. So it's uh, not the best position to explore the issue of domain specificity. So we can do that with focal lesions, as in it's the case with neuro-oncological patients. So now we are uh, proving in the Ethics Committee a project to investigate different types of cognitive domain with different uh, 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 types of neuro-oncological uh, patient, patients with damage in different uh, brain areas to see if it is like a general uh, 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 monitoring system or if this can be linked to specific domains, which is this lower part of the model that I didn't uh, discuss much. And we're also exploring uh, differences in denial and nosognosia in general oncological patients in comparison with new oncological patients. Uh, there is a, a very vast literature on uh, denial in cancer in oncological patients. So uh, it's interesting because when you compare oncological and new oncological patients, you have presumably similar psychological factors in operation in both cases, but then in new oncological patients, you have new cognitive factors as well. So by comparing these two clinical groups, you can uh, have new insights about this phenomenon. And again, as I said, the driver for work is to depart from clinical observations to models and experimenting. Great, uh, that's it for me. I'll just do uh, a quick advertisement of the lab. Um, I'm saying here, visit the lab. I know that's not possible now, but uh, stay in touch. Uh, I had the uh, pleasure to collaborate and, and uh, had students and have students from different countries. I realized before the talk, I don't have an American student. So it'd be good to have an American student or collaborate or what have you. Um, Rio is a tough city, but it's also it's a very beautiful place under normal circumstances. So I encourage you at least to get in touch. Uh, it's one of the great things about academia is talking to people from different cultures. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention and of course thanking all the uh, participants and their families that are the reason for work, collaborators and our funding agency. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. McGrubby. We did have a few questions that came in through the chat, so we'll get started with a more um, general question. So overall, based on the evidence you presented and your read of the literature, um, which uh, are, are there other cognitive symptoms that you think might have a, uh, a large contribution to it as, a no, as uh, <laughs> a nose agnosia, that's a mouthful. Um, so, for example, this person is curious about whether episodic memory or working memory may play a bigger contributor, or is there overall strong evidence of multiple pathways? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, if I get back to the model, uh, we have, you may notice that uh, we have 
almost like a hierarchical uh, uh, number of systems, of memory systems. And what I think happens here is that it's not only that this, uh, these different modules, they, they have uh, uh, different contributions, uh, but it's also uh, how if you don't have working memory or if you don't have episodic memory, then it's hard for you to develop a uh, well-defined uh, 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 personal concept. So these features here of the model, they're more linked to uh, uh, a sense of self and information about your self-ability. And here at uh, the lower levels of the model, you have something like working memory. Without, for instance, without working memory, then you, you're not able, or you're not capable of doing online error monitoring. Uh, so for online error monitoring, you need working memory. And then you, you need episodic memory to have the episodes, you consolidate the episodes, you're going to ground your sense of ability. So an interesting feature that I didn't uh, mention is that we also have a generic memory system here. So this is general semantic knowledge. And this is to actually to um, incorporate the dissociation between self and other uh, 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 sensibility. Why is that? We know that when um, people with impaired self awareness, when they rely on their generic uh, semantic uh, memory, uh, when you expose them to vignettes describing uh, clinical cases, typically they will show good awareness of how the person in the, in the ad should proceed. So it seems there is also a dissociation between self and other memory. Uh, and that's very relevant, I think, from a clinical point of view. So essentially, I think there are different abilities. They all contribute and uh, they give um, uh, slightly different contributions and they lead to slightly different presentations. That's how I would reply to your question. Perfect. Thank you for that overview. That really helps. Um, the next question is about, I think it was related to the slide where you said 79% um, prevalence of anosognosia in that population. Um, yeah. So 